Thank you, Kaya. Uh, I would like also to welcome everybody to the event hosted by the Center of the Study of Europe. Uh, very topical uh, and up to date, I would say. I know that there is vivid interest, not, not just in a student community, but in a broader community for what's going on in Europe, in the Europe, particularly in and uh, in, in, in around Ukraine. Um, as you said, my name is Vesko Garcevic, and I was former ambassador um, uh, of Montenegro to NATO and national coordinator of my country uh, for NATO membership. So through that, I somehow attach um, part of my interest to what's going on in Ukraine, around Ukraine, uh, uh, and given Russia's influence in the Balkans also, I uh, as a part of my uh, my interest. I really, uh, you know, I'm honored to be uh, today with you and to uh, introduce Olena Lennon, um, uh, who is an adjunct professor of political science and national security at the University of New Haven, uh, where uh, she teaches their courses uh, in U.S. foreign and defense policy, international relations, conflict resolution, com comparative politics and American government. She also taught political economy of Russia at the University of Bridgeport. Her work uh, explores issues of conflict management, reconciliation, transitional justice, especially in the context of the war in Ukraine. Uh, she serves as a co-editor of a scholarly blog at Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute on Conflict Resolution and Reconciliation in Ukraine. So, um, I know that she has been involved uh, with various civil society organizations, both here in the US and Ukraine, dedicated to assisting Ukraine in its fight for freedom, democracy, and rule of law. Uh, so definitely we have um, somebody who is expert in Ukraine to share with us her thoughts, ideas, and I'm uh, looking forward to uh, stimulating um, presentation and debate following the presentation. Olena, uh, floor is yours uh, and uh, uh, welcome. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, as you know, there's a lot going on um, and many different perspectives, and I really appreciate you joining the conversation. I'm very much looking forward to this. Um, uh, not to inflict another PowerPoint presentation on you, I, I would pay to do this on the Friday morning, uh, but just in the interest of uh, visualizing um, uh, some of the dynamics that are happening around Ukraine, I think it would be uh, essential that we look at some maps. Uh, so please bear with me as I um, uh, share some slides with you to contextualize my, my points. Um, you know, I plan to, uh, to give you some initial uh, overview for about 20, 25 minutes, and then I'm really looking forward to everybody's comments and, and questions. Uh, but let me start by bringing up uh, uh, Ukraine's map, in fact, because you know, it's, uh, it will be quite relevant in, in our conversation as we discuss the magnitude of uh, troop buildup on Ukraine's border, um, and uh, what are some of the potential scenarios for an attack that are being discussed. Um, so I, I think that uh, it would be very helpful for all of us um, as much as, again, as a teacher, um, I hate to put you in the position to, uh, to, to have a PowerPoint presentation uh, in front of you, uh, but only for a few minutes. So let me just share my slides um, real quick. Okay, excellent. All right. Um, well, as you know, uh, you know we are now in a very um, critical moment in um, in history. Really, um, things are very dynamic, as I'm sure everybody realizes. Uh, things change every day. You know, when um, Elizabeth reached out to me a few weeks ago um, with um, sort of a, a, an offer to do this talk, um, I thought, um, you know, I I actually expected things to be even much worse by now because. Well, how, in my opinion, um, how predictable some of these dynamics have been, but in the at the same time, um, as we have seen in the last couple of weeks, um, you know, there's still a lot of interactive events and, and things are still, a lot of things are still contingent um, and uh, very dynamic. I'm sure you you're all aware of, uh, um, of a, a new sort of a breakout of violence that happened yesterday. Um, that we will discuss a little bit later. Um, but for now, I just wanted to give a very brief overview as to uh, where we're at in this particular moment and, and why, in my opinion, 
um, these developments uh, were in fact predictable. Um, so as you may know, um, you know uh, the Russian forces are now surrounding Ukraine pretty much from uh, all directions. Um, you know we're looking at the last estimate I believe was about 150,000 troops. Um, and that have, uh, in fact, linked up with the prepositioned equipment that had been uh, pulled to the Ukrainian border uh, for the last few months. So the, the buildup actually started last year. And I think that's one of the um, uh, conversation points, I think, that, that sometimes doesn't make uh, or doesn't receive enough attention in current conversations because of the ongoing crisis. Uh, but you know the, the preparations for this particular operation had been in place for um, at least a year, um, and um, you know if if we you know kind of look back uh, even a few years ago, then um, it you know the hypothesis is uh, or my hypothesis is that um, you know these events uh, could have been anticipated. Uh, but currently, we're also looking at um, not just media reporting on um, you know, this sort of massive troop buildup uh, around Ukraine, uh, but also um, you know, the, the, yesterday the British intelligence uh, services, the Ministry of, of Defense of Great Britain put out a map um, where they outlined some of the uh, scenarios for a potential invasion um, that uh, intelligence services believe could be imminent. Um, at this point, um, Russian forces are forward deployed um, and could attack on very short notice. Um, I know these are very ominous uh, red arrows that um, you know we have all seen circulating um, on social media uh, and in various uh, media outlets. Um, you know, they, they it may seem as though uh, these are exaggerated projections, but at the same time, if we look at military posture, um, then it becomes quite clear that um, a, an attack is is in fact possible. Um, because what we're seeing is, um, you know, a, a threat is a threat when capabilities match up with intent, right? So what we're still holding our breath for is what exactly is the intent? Um, because the capabilities are already there. Um, and now what my goal today uh, was to help um, clarify political objectives that, uh, you know, crystallize uh, or illuminate that part of the, uh, of the equation, and that is intent. What is um, Russia's intent here, because you know, like I said, we will fully realize that at this point, um, there you know any any one scenario is as plausible as the other one. Uh, what, what what's happening right now is that Putin has uh, presented himself with many options, and it's just a matter of uh, choosing the, the right option depending on how political objectives um, clarify and crystallize uh, according to, to the Russian government. Now, you might have heard Secretary Blinken yesterday uh, in, during his presentation at the United Nations Council um, uh, you know, provided a very detailed overview of what um, a, a potential regime change might look in Kyiv in, in, in a matter of days, um, with um, Russia potentially executing airstrikes followed by ground troops uh, cyber attacks uh, with the intent to pin down Ukrainian troops, uh, disable communication networks, um, and in fact, occupy swaths of territory and, and, and uh, institute some sort of a regime change with, with a uh, potential uh, occupation that might in fact uh, become, you know, start out as temporary, but become more pro prolonged occupation on, on large territories of Ukraine. Um, so uh, with, with all of these dynamics, then the question that the questions that naturally arise um, are, you know, and, and these are the questions that I frequently receive from uh, various media outlets. And these questions are, um, why, why has Russia amassed so, so many troops around Ukraine? Um, now, keep in mind, too, that about half of uh, the contingent that's now amassed around Ukraine are permanent uh, troops, in fact. Uh, so Russia already has enough. Um, a military force surrounding Ukraine to, to be threatening, right, to uh, engage in coercive diplomacy. So this is looking like it's, it's beyond uh, coercive diplomacy and that, that, that is in fact, um, the current buildup is indicative of uh, a military operation that is being staged. Um, and now the other question here is that why the threat of an invasion, right? So what is it that Putin is trying to achieve that cannot be achieved otherwise? Uh, what are the specific objectives here that require a military intervention or, you know, from Putin's point of view, you know, why have things escalated to this point where 
uh, a reinvasion of Ukraine is necessary when there is in fact still an active war zone in the East. Uh, and there's still a lot of levers of influence available to Russia uh, to continue putting pressure on, uh, on the Ukrainian government. So why, why the threat of an invasion? Why now? Uh, that's a question frequently asked, and then I will touch on that as well, and how will this end? Hopefully we'll um, incorporate this particular question into a conversation with all of us here uh, in, in, in trying to brainstorm, you know, how, what are some potential resolution scenarios here? Um, so um, you, you might have heard too that um, you know things have only escalated in the last few days, uh, despite uh, some of the narratives coming out of the Kremlin uh, that uh, you know certain units had been pulled back uh, to their home bases, uh, to their permanent bases. Although, as um, you know, numerous intelligence services have shown, uh, it's actually the opposite. Uh, that Russia has added about seven thousand more troops in the last few days. Um, and uh, you know these these units are forward deployed. Uh, they're combat ready, and and all the enablers for combat operations are also in place. You know, such as uh, engineering units, field hospitals, uh, and and other things. Um, so, to kind of shed some light on as to why this is happening, and and why uh, President Putin is resorting to the to the means that he's resorting to. Um, we really need to look at it as a, 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 as a complex dynamic between, um, on the one hand, relationship between Ukraine and Russia. So that's one dimension of this war. Um, and uh, another dimension that, that overlaps with that is relationships among domestic forces within Ukraine. So we're talking about um, you know, some uh, polarization uh, happening within the Ukrainian society, uh, you know, the more proverbial pro-Russian uh, versus pro-Ukrainian uh, sentiments, although these are overly simplified uh, um, and uh, not necessarily realistic um, uh, e examinations of the Ukrainian identity, but nonetheless, um, you know, they're, they're there. And also the third dimension is the relationship between Russia and the West. So all three of these uh, uh, relationship dynamics are in play here as we look at, um, and at the situation and try to understand how to best uh, resolve this crisis or manage this crisis. Uh, the resolution is probably um, a bit optimistic at this point. Now, I borrowed this framework from uh, Paul Denieri, who um, two years ago wrote an excellent book that I recommend, Ukraine and Russia, From Civilized Divorce to Uncivil War. Um, so um, what, you know, what does that mean uh, to us on the ground in terms of how these um, different relationships play out? Um, so the current troop buildup and Russia's objectives really have three different um, um, pathways, so to speak, or um, targets. Um, so there's a set of demands that are specific to Ukraine. Russia also had put out a set of demands that are specific to NATO and NATO expansion. And these um, demands have to do with Europe's security architecture um, and the overall um, sort of military posturing in, 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 uh, in Europe. Um, and, and how uh, that threat is perceived on, on different sides of that equation. Uh, and then the third target here is the US specific demands and grievances that have to do with um, the, you know, the more global great power competition. As much as I personally dislike this term because I think it's too vague, but nonetheless, I, I think for the purposes of this conversation, it would be very helpful context for us to, to situate this uh, buildup and, and this kind of impending invasion in the context of more global dynamics um, that are unraveling between the United States and China and, and the United States and Russia. Um, so before I proceed, I wanna briefly touch on each of these uh, grievances that Russia um, had put forward in, um, you know, in trying to, and I, I don't think that they're ne necessarily trying to negotiate these. So at this point, we are at a stage of exchanging ultimatums where um, negotiations uh, you know, have so far failed um, and the, everybody's positions seem to be irreconcilable. Um, before I dive into all of that, I, I just wanna point out that despite the fact that Russia has demands for various um, actors in this case, Ukraine is the one that's being held hostage, right? So Ukraine is at gunpoint now uh, while demands are in fact uh, presented to um, other actors as well. So there's a lot, you know, there, there are, you know, there's a lot of conversations going on about, you know, what does Putin want? What does Putin think? You know, this is what we call Putinology. 
uh, where you know everybody's trying to get in Putin's head and figure out what his next move is. So instead of doing that, I decided to go to the uh, uh, to the primary source and actually um, um, present some um, some language that Putin himself used in trying to uh, illuminate this situation, so that we're not making assumptions; we're actually quoting directly from Putin to understand whether you know, he means what he says and whether these are in fact serious intentions of um, uh, re, uh, potentially uh, uh, instituting a regime change in Kiev. So um, in this infamous essay published last year, um, in July of last year called uh, On the Historical Unity of Russians and Ukrainians, and I highlighted some of the key points here in which Putin said, uh, Russians and Ukrainians were one people, a single whole. It is what I have said on numerous occasions and what I firmly believe. Um, so this is really important context to know that, um, you know, Putin himself admitted that he had long cherished this dream of reuniting Russian and Ukrainian people because his version of history, um, and not just his, you know, but many uh, uh, political elites in Russia um, subscribe to, to this version of history. And that, and that, I think, is one of the things that will present a problem for us going forward, because it's not just Putin and what he wants and what he thinks. Um, there is a, a sense of a political consensus on the role of Ukraine in, in Russia's uh, history. Um, now, additionally, Putin in the same essay um, also said that uh, the idea of Ukrainian people as a nation separate from the Russians started to form and gain ground among the Polish elite and the part of the Malorussian um, Malo intelligentsia. Since there was no historical basis and could not have been any, uh, conclusions were substantiated by all sorts of um, conclusions, which went as far as to claim that the Ukrainians are the true Slavs and the Russians. So the bottom line is um, that, they, that Putin believes that um, the idea that the Ukrainian people are separate came out of Western uh, political thought and that, uh, that Western uh, European countries used this idea that Ukrainians are a separate nation for their own, uh, you know, to, to exploit it and for their own uh, purposes. Um, so that's another sort of piece of mythology that um, you know, Putin also believes in. Uh, and then finally on Crimea, because that's going to be critical to our understanding of, um, you know, how Russia perceives uh, that particular annexation and whether they think it's negotiable. Going forward, in 1954, Putin said the Crimean region of the Russian Federation was given to the Ukrainian um, Socialist Republic uh, in gross violation of legal norms that were in force at the time. So fundamentally, Putin believes that when Crimea was given to uh, Ukraine during the Soviet Union times, that was an egregious violation of uh, international law and, hi and historical justice. Therefore, it had to be returned to Russia. Now, these are, again, I'm quoting from Putin so that I'm not making assumptions on his behalf. And then finally, um, his view of the Maidan revolution from the same essay is that he, he said that well before 2014, the United States and European countries systematically and consistently pushed Ukraine to curtail and limit economic cooperation with Russia. So uh, where does that place us? Um, you know, Russia, um, you know, with, with, with their view of history, uh, believes that uh, it had been robbed of its influence in Eastern Europe. Uh, therefore, their most recent demands uh, when during the buildup um, that started last year were fundamentally about three things, removal of NATO troops and weapons from countries that joined the alliance after 1997. And we're talking about 14 different countries. Um, providing legal guarantees uh, of no further NATO enlargement, that obviously implies Ukraine and Georgia, and also ban uh, troops and missiles in areas where they could be perceived as threatening by both Russia and the United States. Um, so um, as you can see here, uh, it's quite clear by looking at these points that at least two of them are um, non-starters. You know, there's absolutely, these are non-negotiable points. So, and, and the Russians always knew it. So, which is the first signal that um, there was no genuine interest in you know, negotiations that the Russians had put out these proposals um, in, intending them or expecting them to fail and not be accepted uh, by Western leaders uh, to have, um, you know, you know, some sort of a justification for uh, a um, for escalation and the use of military force 
uh, based on the fact that a, a, an attempted diplomatic solution had failed. Um, so in the background of, of these um, demands, um, of course, it would be important to remind us of what exactly happened, um, because the, the, these, um, these grievances that, that Russia is trying to correct uh, by using military force in Ukraine and potentially invading and holding terrain and, and changing regimes in Kiev, that's still a very plausible option given the military posture and political signaling. Um, you know, these grievances go all the way back to at least 2013, 2014, if not earlier in, in history, as we had discussed, um, uh, when the Maidan revolution installed uh, or uh, ousted a pro-Russia president, uh, Yadunkovich, uh, and uh, brought about a more pro-Western and, and uh, pro-EU government. Um, now, as you know, in 2014, then following those events, um, Russia, <clears throat> excuse me, annexed Crimea, and also um, created these sort of Russia-backed republics in the uh, Donetsk and, and Luhansk regions um, by, by referendum that are considered illegitimate. Now, the reason I'm, I'm sort of reminding um, everybody of this particular historical effect is because, um, so what Russia is trying to do now is undo uh, the, um, the results of the Maidan revolution because they fundamentally believe that uh, the, the government brought by the Maidan revolution is illegitimate. Um, and it, it was orchestrated by the CIA, um, and therefore, it, you know, it, it, it is uh, upon Russia to correct that um, mistake and to reverse the course of history that the Maidan Revolution brought, which, of course, is, um, you know, obviously a very um, uh, flawed um, uh, perception and understanding of the Maidan Revolution and uh, the uh, the genuine uh, organic forces that uh, that led to the ouster of uh, of uh, President Yanukovych. Um, but again, that's um, you know that, that perhaps you know we're not going to go into detail on that. But it, I just wanted to highlight that um, these the intent that we're seeing right now manifesting was the troop buildup goes back to at least 2013, 2014. So Putin had been preparing for this for a very long time. Um, now, where we're at with the current situation, um, we have about um, 280 miles off front line. So again, as a reminder that it's not a new occupation. And what we're facing right now is a possibility of um, uh, military escalation beyond what's already um, in, um, uh, in, in Eastern Ukraine and in the Donbass region. Now, 280 miles is approximately the distance from um, where Boston University to Philadelphia, if that gives you an idea as to um, how long or short the, uh, the front line is. Uh, so if you were to drive from Boston to Philadelphia, you, you would be driving along the, um, the line of contact in Ukraine. Uh, since 2014, more than 13,000 civilians had been killed as a result of, um, military, of kinetic activities and not only. Um, there are about one, one and a half million in displaced, internally displaced persons. Um, obviously, Ukraine had suffered economically. There is a, um, an ongoing humanitarian crisis, not just in occupied territories, but also um, you know, throughout Ukraine. And then landmines is one of the legacies of this war is, is one of the um, more devastating consequences that will have far reaching effects in the future. Um, so uh, where that, that brings us is how um, you know, the, the ceasefire is holding right now. And Minsk too is going to be a, a big part of the conversation and when we try to understand what Russia is trying to achieve now, because um, what, what Russia is trying to do really is to force Ukraine to implement a Minsk II ceasefire agreement that was signed in 2015 at gunpoint. President Poroshenko signed it while a, um, a Debaltseva, one of the most lethal battles of 2014 uh, was unraveling as these negotiations were happening, uh, putting pressure on Poroshenko to sign this agreement that is fundamentally um, uh, unfavorable to Ukraine um, and uh, is flawed by design and, and, and one that Ukraine had um, struggled to implement for a variety of reasons. So one of those, uh, a few of those reasons are listed here on the slide um, you know, some of the uh, kind of fundamental structural flaws of this agreement um, are that Russia is not party to conflict, um, and it's sort of documented and formalized in the Minsk agreement that, um, that Ukraine is at war with Russia-backed 
um, separatists uh, or rebels, you know, the various ways in which uh, people are referred to, to those um, entities. But nonetheless, Russia denies involvement. Uh, the order of, of the implementation of this agreement is questionable because the Russian view is that Ukraine should hold elections in occupied territories um, and um, change the constitution to allow these so-called republics to be um, uh, independent and autonomous within Ukraine, while the Ukrainian order of, of implementation um, is such that Russia should withdraw its military support first, and then elections can be held. And of course, that becomes an, an, sort of an impossible scenario because Russia doesn't think it's there. Um, and then the status of the republics, the Russian view is that these republics should be federalized as in you know, maintaining a, a, a greater degree of independence in, in their foreign affairs. And the Ukrainian view of the status of the republics that it's uh, more of a decentralization model in which uh, you know, these sort of entities would receive uh, uh, you know, a certain degree of autonomy, but they would still, um, uh, but not foreign policy, but not uh, control of foreign policy. And then there's also disagreement on, on how amnesty uh, is to be approached um, for people, you know, locals of the Donbass area who had participated in combat activities, um, you know, what kind of, kind of future awaits them. Um, so um, the reason, another reason uh, we're seeing this buildup uh, has to do with, again, domestic politics in Ukraine, um, particularly a, a very uh, significant and noticeable pivot by the Zelensky administration against um, Russia. You know, even though Zelensky ran a, a peaceful campaign, um, you know, focused on diplomacy and talking to Putin and sort of uh, and negotiating a new peace agreement. And then he very, you know, he very quickly realized that um, it was not going to happen um, because you know, Russia doesn't even consider itself a party to conflict, but also because it was unpopular in Ukraine. Uh, Zelensky very quickly realized that the pursuit of diplomatic talks with, with Russia was uh, very unpopular domestically um, and could potentially be a political suicide for him. So he, uh, I mean, you know, he took a hard turn and um, banned a Russian uh, three key channels of, um, you know, what's considered to be Russian influence, Russian propaganda in uh, in Ukraine, and sanctioned one of uh, Russia's key proxies and allies in Ukraine, uh, Viktor Medvedchuk, um, a notorious oligarch who is the leader of the opposition party linked to Russia. So all of these dynamics had um, created an impression in Putin's head that um, there is just no way to negotiate with Zelensky. Zelensky is, uh, in, in Putin's eyes, is a lost cause. Um, and he, um, you know, he, he offers no hope to Russia that um, there, there can be um, any sort of reconciliation of those differences and, and the implementation of the Minsk agreement as Russia sees it fit. Now, the, the second dimension of, of those grievances uh, that has to do with NATO, of course, um, has to do with NATO enlargement and, and Putin's demands that uh, uh, expansion post-1997 be rolled back um, and that Georgia and Ukraine uh, be, should be forever forsworn from uh, joining NATO, which of course is a, is a non-starter for Western leaders um, because uh, it fundamentally compromises on a, um, a, one of the key principles of the alliance, and that is the open door policy that assumes that nations are free to decide their own future. Um, now, another, um, dimen another uh, source of grievances uh, that uh, Russia um, sort of contributed to, uh, to this dynamic it has to do with, uh, with, the United State, with the United States itself, um, aside from NATO. So, and that kind of brings us to the, that last component of uh, why we're seeing this escalation and what these demands, demands are related to. And that has to do with the US influence in, in Ukraine that Russia perceives um, as encroaching on its own sphere of influence because they fundamentally want a return to uh, a more, um, uh, a less Western centric world in which these neo imperial powers have uh, spheres of influence um, and um, a say in, in the security architecture. Uh, so as, as you may know, US-Ukraine cooperation has been growing, um, not only in terms of military assistance and, and weapon transfers, but also um, in terms of military exercises um, and uh, training, uh, tactical training that the US Special Forces had been providing in Ukraine. 
um, and other areas of cooperation on, on multiple fronts. Um, so much so, in fact, that last year, Ukraine and the United States signed the strategic defense um, in the framework that further solidified and, and structured that cooperation um, and, and um, uh, kind of provided further avenues for um, uh, helping Ukraine. The, the idea behind this framework was to continue helping Ukraine um, achieve its goal of joining NATO uh, one day. So NATO was very much a big part of that. Um, so in response to those demands, um, as you may know, the United States uh, responded and NATO responded to Russia's demands by offering to negotiate arms control, negotiate missile placement in Europe, um, increase transparency and confidence building measures uh, only to be denied by Russia as not meeting uh, their demands and objectives, which uh, tells us that Russia is not interested in compartmentalized foreign policy. They're not interested in issue-based negotiations. They, um, uh, they want everything or nothing because uh, the United States and NATO uh, allies had in fact um, uh, you know, proposed to negotiate some of these um, issues that might be threatening to Russia, um, but they were all declined and Russia insists um, that, you know, these, um, that they're, they're, they had not been heard and that, that their demands had not been listened to. Um, just yesterday, um, and then this is gonna be, I'm finishing up my, my slides here, um, just yesterday, I, I didn't even, I did not see a, an English version of it, so I apologize for a, a, a text of, a, a snapshot of the original text there. Um, but basically what, what, what Russians had delivered to the um, uh, U.S. Embassy yesterday uh, was an official response to, um, um, you know, to, to the U.S.'s proposal to negotiate um, and the response basically is the same. They, they just yesterday said that um, the West offers um, unsatisfactory um, trade-offs and, uh, and Russia might have to resort to unspecified military technical measures. And they specifically used the word uh, force Ukraine to implement Minsk II. Um, and the United States must discontinue uh, U.S. military aid. So what that signals to me is that um, one of the plausible scenarios right now being considered by Putin is, is um, you know, escalating militarily to bring uh, Zelensky back to the negotiating table and to uh, force Western leaders to force Zelensky um, with whatever means they have available to them uh, to, in fact, implement uh, this uh, ceasefire agreement uh, on Russia's terms. Now, the choices available to Zelensky are few he truly is between a rock and a hard place here. Um, so what I'm seeing um, right now was, was this situation that, um, and this is something that I wrote uh, recently about, and I have a new piece coming out about this phenomenon um, that I think um, is, is happening all around, and that is war optimism. Not War optimism, not only um, as it is, um, uh, as it manifests itself in, in Russia's decision making, but there's, there's a, a lot of war optimism, in my opinion, that the Zelensky administration had engaged in unnecessarily. And also there's a lot of war optimism on um, Western leaders in assuming that, um, that Russia might be either uh, risk averse or uh, not strong enough to, to hold Ukraine or to occupy Ukraine. And I think that they might be awfully optimistic in those assumptions. So it's a form of self-deception that leads one to make overly optimistic judgments about their chances of achieving their objectives by inflating gains and downplaying risks. Um, so I fundamentally believe that all parties involved currently um, from you know, Western leaders to Ukraine to Russia have in one way or another engaged in war optimism that had um, kind of created these irreconcilable positions in a way. But obviously, um, you know, Ukraine is a victim in this situation, uh, but the way sort of the Zelensky administration responded to um, these uh, ongoing threat had always raised eyebrows in terms of whether it was adequate enough in, um, uh, in being transparent to, in, in, to the Ukrainian people about uh, what's coming potentially. Um, so why now, uh, lastly, and um, why now? Um, the reason I believe um, we're seeing this right now um, is because um, in Russia has, uh, Russia is in a pretty good spot uh, economically right now. It has a modernized armed force. 
it has virtually no public debt. Um, it you know it had acquired a, a sub substantial currency reserve um, that you know the rainy day fund that uh, they are counting on to sanction proof uh, to uh, create a sanction proof economy. Um, the Europeans had been increasingly leaning away from uh, Russia's energy, although obviously it's really hard to uh, cut that cord, but nonetheless, a lot of European policy had been um, intentionally designed to steer away from Russia's energy, to uh, deny them that, that political weapon. There are also post-pandemic vulnerabilities among Western countries. Um, a lot of um, countries now post-pandemic are looking more inward. Uh, domestic audiences are less and less supportive of foreign interventions. So Russia is capitalizing on this moment uh, when you know, everybody is distracted and vulnerable and perhaps has different priorities uh, to, to execute something they had always wished to execute. This has always been a plan to reverse this pro-Western trajectory that, Russia, that Ukraine had, um, had, um, had gotten on and uh, to return Ukraine to Russia's sphere of influence, in fact. Um, but no less important uh, is, is the fact that um, uh, it's not lost on the Russians that Ukrainians are a very different people now, that this, the sense of nationalism and patriotism in Ukraine has uh, revived on a scale unimaginable before. Um, and obviously, eight years of war had fueled more patriotic, more uh, pro-Western and more anti-Russian sentiments among Ukrainians, even in Eastern Ukraine. And, and Russia is watching these dynamics and realizing that um, you know, time is not on their side. Uh, Ukrainians are only getting more anti-Russian. Um, sanctions are only increasing. Um, and uh, you know, countries are only, uh, NATO is only uh, sort of militarizing and fortifying the Eastern flank. Uh, so the time might just be now um, to take advantage of that. Plus, of course, you know, Putin is um, uh, kind of he realizes that um, you know he may not be in, in power forever. Um, although he probably has still has a few uh, you know 10, 20 years available to him. Uh, but nonetheless, as you can see on this graph, uh, even support for NATO, the the blue bar um, has been consistently rising in Ukraine, and it correlates um, even it correlates with the support for EU membership. So the sentiment in Ukraine right now uh, nationwide is that people are much more supportive of NATO and EU membership than they were uh, pre-2013, 2014. Um, and, and that is a, um, a, a very sort of a dangerous trajectory for Putin. Um, and um, and, and uh, it, it is also indicative of the direction that Ukraine has chosen. So in, in, um, in, to, to kind of wrap it up, uh, where I see things going is that we will probably what, you know, we're in a protracted, potentially in a very violent protracted conflict with uh, basically two options available to us at this point. Um, it's either well, Putin has a lot of options available to him militarily. What I think he might be considering right now is whether he uh, would continue forcing Zelensky to implement Minsk II, or if he, you know, pretty much scraps uh, Minsk II and, um, you know, institutes some sort of a regime change in Ukraine and forces Ukraine to sign some other agreement that is going to be even more maximalist in its demands. Um, uh, and it will be way worse than Minsk II that will basically um, imply a complete loss of sovereignty for Ukraine. Thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Olena, for your uh, really um, uh, insightful, comprehensive, informative uh, uh, presentation. Uh, from my side, I would say that I like that you introduced, brought in, brought up uh, the issue of uh, history, revisionism, um, identity issues, um, and culture, uh, church that was not mentioned. Uh, for uh, some people in the West, uh, you know, when they look um, at the situation in Ukraine and Eastern Europe, somehow overlook the importance of those those issues uh, so uh indeed I, I i appreciate your comments about why now and uh, i very much subscribe with everything you said uh, so um uh, today uh or uh, if i if i if i if I'm not wrong, but today and tomorrow and this weekend, actually, uh, world leaders are going to meet in Munich 
for a security conference for the for the first time since 1999 russia is not uh there uh and that brings me to a couple of comments and then question to you and also i would like to invite guests to post questions in the chat room uh use chat room to post questions i hope that there will be enough questions for us to discuss the issue from different perspectives uh, when it comes to russia's uh, perspective let's say russia's goal that you outlined uh, so far um many uh, in the west uh, highlight so-called ukraine paradoxes Pairing, trying to offer a bunch of arguments by which um, um, potential invasion uh, will not work in favor of uh, Russia. Uh, I may just list a couple of them. For example, uh, uh, an invasion would make the idea of security arrangement impossible. Uh, for NATO, may reconsider its obligation uh, stemming from NATO Russia Founding Act in 1997. Uh, which then actually may lead NATO to deploy permanently troops in Eastern Europe, including 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 Ukraine. The Nord Stream two will be definitely cancelled. Uh, and then uh, uh, also, I will quote Natalia Tocci, director of Italian Institute for Foreign Affairs, uh, who uh, lately said that uh, Putin made a miracle and united us which means united europeans over over their support to ukraine so but i would pose a question uh, about something else uh, since you as i remember as i found wrote an interesting uh, interesting uh, article uh, arguing for striking a balance between the possible and the desirable when it comes to occupied territories so uh, uh, question is, is it fair to argue that uh, uh, the government in Kyiv is now prioritizing political independence over territorial integrity uh, to the extent that, uh, you know, Russia is more interested in the territorial integrity of Ukraine than Kyiv is in terms of territorial integrity with two separate regions integrated as republics within, uh, within Ukraine. Um, uh, does it mean that with Donbas fully integrated, Ukraine cannot be fully independent of Russia's influence? Or to make it simpler, does Russia want a Bosnian Herzegovinian uh, scenario in uh, in Ukraine uh, to have some something similar, Republic of Srpska, to completely control uh, internal dynamics in the country? Thank you so much for, for your comments and for that uh, very insightful question. And, you know, I think this question was um, very much the key, the question um, about a year ago when we were still talking about re possible reintegration of Donbass, you know, how, um, you know, the sort of de-escalation or how uh, to de-conflict that line of contact. Um, and, you know, it, there were a lot of uh, speculations as to whether Russia would, in fact, proceed to de, de facto annex those, uh, so, you know, republics, so to speak, or uh, if the ultimate, ultimate goal is to reintegrate them um, back into Ukraine so that Russia would have uh, their own uh, instruments of, of influence, right? And that was originally the plan. So Russia had never intended to actually control these territories. You know, it's, it's a huge liability and it's absolutely, it's, it's more costly uh, than it is beneficial. The idea was to um, undermine Ukraine's sovereignty, to destabilize Ukraine, uh, to, um, you know, to, to bleed its army, um, to bleed its resources and to basically um, make Ukraine you know, weak enough for Ukraine to be vulnerable and uh, make concessions to Russia. So Donbass, well, these republics had, have always been um, levers of influence on Ukraine. Uh, but what Putin had realized in the last you know, seven years is that that scenario did, failed to achieve the results that he was hoping for. It failed to um, uh, to extract concessions from Kiev. It failed to prevent Ukraine from cooperating with NATO. What we're seeing now, short of formal membership, Ukraine only intense has only intensified its cooperation with NATO. It has only intensified its economic relationships with the EU, right? So the level of support has only increased for Ukraine, and that is not. Um, that is not what Putin had counted on, right? 
So he had uh, counted on impoverishing Ukraine and, and undermining its chances of Western integration uh, by using these republics as, um, as a lever of influence. However, again, um, uh, it didn't work. And I think that that's why he's recalibrating now is because he realizes that those limited military campaigns and you know, low intensity conflict that he created to kind of dial up and dial down accordingly in Ukraine had not, um, had not brought about the results that he needed um, in pursuit of his geopolitical objectives. And again, I, I quoted from what he wrote himself in terms of what his ultimate vision is. So we're not reading into it, right? We're not assuming some you know, master plan. We're just quoting from what Putin had been saying this whole time. And, and, and the other component of that, the reason why I don't think um, that, uh, you know, it is about the republics and, and uh, who is ultimately going to control them is because he's going for political influence and he's, he's, he's going for Ukraine's geopolitical orientation. You know, he's going for Kiev. Um, what matters to him is the direction in which Kiev goes, not the direction in which Dan Donetsk and Luhansk go. Um, that's secondary. Uh, again, those, those regions have, all, have always been instruments, not uh, targets of, of their own. Um, and, and the other kind of component of that is that you may know that um, just you know, a couple of days ago, the Russian, Doom, the Russian parliament presented, voted to present an official proposal to Putin to formally recognize those republics. Um, and if that were to happen, then that would mean that Minsk II is um, uh, out of the window. So the moment Russia recognizes those republics, that means that they officially withdrew from Minsk II. And that could also mean that an invasion becomes even more likely because now they would be forcing Zelensky, um, they would you know, escalate things militarily to force Zelensky to the negotiate, negotiating table to sign some Minsk III. It's not gonna be Minsk anymore, but it would be some other agreement that would be even more maximalist and even more beneficial to Russia. So far, Putin has not approved, he has not uh, indicated that he's leaning in that direction um, of recognition of the Republic. So, um, so I, I think that he, he's still considering whether Minsk II, Minsk II might in fact be um, a workable solution. And, and, but it's not workable for Ukraine. So the, the, the options that I think Zelensky faces right now is whether he caves in and faces a, an internal upheaval. There will be a, a tremendous internal backlash potentially a um, you know, overthrow of Zelensky's regime if he caves into Russia. If he doesn't cave in, then he's facing to be overthrown by Putin. Um, so Zelensky really is, is in a tough spot right now. He, he has no good options. Um, and I, I think he's, his best case right now is to stall for time um, and uh, you know, see if, if the Western leaders can, can in fact um, offer some, uh, negotiate with Putin on some terms uh, to uh, to prevent this escalation, and then um, and then lastly, um, you may remember too that last year the the massive passportization campaign around elections in Russia, when um, you know several thousand people, I don't remember the exact number now, uh, but it's um, a substantial proportion of people in these occupied republics have received Russian passports. So I think we are moving in the de facto annexation of these territories um, and potentially maybe down the, you know, in the future, um, uh, I, I, I don't see reintegration possible in the near future, but maybe in the long term, that would remain to be um, uh, a hope. Thank you. Before before turning to questions, I I, I have I, I saw one question for you, and I just want uh, to remind others either to use chat room, as I said, or Q and A function to pose questions. I have one more question for you, um, uh, Lena, since you inspired me to pose a question. Let me let imagine that like a really negative scenario that Russia um, at one point annex uh, those two um, you know uh, breakaway territories. But then whether this will lead to uh, Ukrainian even further 
for Ukraine to turn to the West, which means from the strategic point of view, uh, it will be actually a failure for Russia because then uh, uh, the Western Ukraine will turn to uh, to the uh, to the to NATO. First of all, NATO, I would say, even some hesitant countries uh, from the Western Europe. I won't mention any, but we know which ones. Uh, would be uh, likely uh, would likely accept Ukraine as a NATO member, and then um, instead of pushing NATO back, this will uh, mean as an end game uh, getting better NATO closer to your doors. Do you think that uh, that that scenario is something which uh, Moscow uh, wants to happen? Hence the invasion. You're absolutely correct. That is exactly where things are moving. Hence, the escalation. Because Russia, Putin realizes that he has no other options. Everything is, you know, things are only turning um, in, in the trajectory that um, Ukraine is on and that Western leaders, uh, the level of support, right, that Ukraine has received. Um, points to the fact that um, there are very few options available to Russia to reverse this course of integration unless they, um, you know, uh, apply the ultimate military force, right? So they basically decapitate the regime, right? Um, hold terrain um, and then institute, you know, kind of build these um, uh, pseudo institutions uh, similar to the institutions that they create, the pseudo institutions that they created in the occupied republics, um, so to speak. So, and, and that you, I mean, you're exactly correct. And I think that is the reality and the truth that we're seeing right now is that given the trajectory of, and the possibilities of Ukraine uh, moving away, for, further moving away from Russia, um, it may not, I don't think it's, it's, it's anywhere close to joining NATO, but um, it hasn't prevented, prevented Ukraine from doing military, joint military exercises, training, um, reconnaissance flight, NATO reconnaissance planes over Ukraine's territory um, in the NATO ships in the Black Sea. So from Russia's point of view, what's the point, you know, why are they holding out for, uh, for NATO if short of formal membership, the level of cooperation is only increasing. Remember that um, a couple of years ago, Putin's red line had been manifestly uh, NATO membership. And about a year ago, the rhetoric started changing to where uh, you know, the Russian leadership started saying, it's not, it's not just NATO membership anymore, it's, it's NATO cooperation that is problematic and NATO infrastructure on Russia's border. Um, so we, we, you know, it's, it, it was quite obvious, again, just reading the signals from Moscow that they had recalibrated and they had pushed that line back to say um, that it's not about formalities, it's about what actually happens. And what they see actually happening is that uh, Ukraine is um, being what they consider as being sort of pulled away from Russia. Uh, where I think Russia is miscalculating is that they assume that uh, the West is behind uh, these um, uh, these ambi Ukrainian ambitions. They really downplay uh, the they, they downplay how genuine that effort is on the Ukrainian part and how much Ukrainians have changed. I don't think they they fully realize uh, the amount of irreversible change that the Ukrainian society had undergone, to where uh, it would be really hard to remobilize even Eastern uh, Ukraine people in Eastern Ukraine to. Um, you know, to change their feelings and, and attitudes toward Russia, it would be extremely hard. And, and that is exactly why we're seeing this impending military invasion, because Russia sees no other way. Thank you. I cannot, go, I cannot agree more. I think that even, even the cooperation with the European Union, as you very well know, uh, was a problem for, for Russia, let alone NATO cooperation. So I have several questions. So let us begin with the first one, uh, and that deals with sanctions. Um, uh, I will read out the question. Thank you, Olana. Uh, uh, I, I just received another one. Uh, it was very interesting. Uh, do you know how many of those currency reserves are dollars? Right. No, um, that, that's exactly right. Um, the, um, you know, when the U.S. is threatening 
the mother of all most punishing sanctions, um, they, I think, expect that it will hurt Russia more than uh, the Russians believe it will hurt Russia. Uh, I don't know the exact numbers. Uh, my understanding was from, um, you know, from uh, is just the sources that I had consulted, I mean, public sources, is that um, you know, Russia feels pretty confident that um, they're actually trying to, to uh, wean themselves off of the dollar. I don't think they're completely there, but I know they had started the uh, um, the process of weaning off the dollar, especially now with the cooperation with China. Um, they're looking at options to where uh, of using other currencies. Um, so again, I'm I'm not a, unfortunately I don't um, I don't know the specifics of um, you know how their their reserve is structured right now. But what I do know is that they're they're really um, there's a sense of optimism in Russia that they can sustain and um, absorb sanctions. I think what Biden is going for, he's going to. Uh, the mother of sanctions is going to fundamentally not just go after financial institutions, but ban imports of aircraft parts and auto parts that Russia relies on. And that's what they're mostly counting on in terms of, you know, having that effect that Russia has not felt yet. Not just, again, targeting financial institutions and even, you know, cutting off SWIFT. Uh, you know, now the experts are saying that even that is survivable for Russia because they have other options. But banning uh, imports of critical components that Russia's defense industry and auto industry relies on uh, would hurt Russia much more than the trick, though, is that it would also hurt the U.S. And that is why uh, sanctions have not been effective is because in trying to punish Russia, the United States and Europe have also tried to cushion their own economy, and it just doesn't work that way. For sanctions to work, everybody has to agree to bear the, the burden, to, to um, feel that pain, right? And to bear the brunt of that burden. Um, and I, and th this is what I'm watching right now. I, I think that would be the right move for the Biden administration to, um, to impose harsher sanctions. Unfortunately, it will come at a cost to all of us. And obviously that's why they're hesitating um, so I, I think that's where the most effect is going to be felt is in sanctioning um, exports on, to Russia um, and sanctioning specific individuals close to uh, Putin, sanctioning Russian oligarchs, and also going after financial institutions. But it has to be a package. The reason sanctions have not worked so far is because they have been incremental. You know, we apply them incrementally and Russia has time and resources to, to absorb the shock of sanctions and then recalibrate, restructure their, um, their economy and, and, and afford uh, to um, execute their political objectives the way they see fit. It, it would have to be a package all at once uh, in cooperation with the EU for sanctions to actually work. Uh, thank you. Kaya has just informed us that uh, while we were uh, discussing Ukraine, uh, 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 Luhansk and Donetsk uh, just announced civilian evacuations because of the threat of Ukrainian false flag attacks. Uh, just keep that in mind. I have several questions. One of them deals with uh, identity issues. Um, and uh, William Franks asked, you know, Putin's statement that Russians and Ukrainians are one people is uh, demonstrably false. Uh, there have been Ukrainian independence movements since the 17th century. If the Nazis hadn't had such terrible racial policies, Ukrainians would have welcomed them as uh, liberators. Does um, debating this issue have any weight in determining the outcome? Uh Debating what issue? Debating the uh, uh, identity issue uh, in Ukraine. Whether Ukrainians are Ukrainians or Russians. Well, it's um, you know it's interesting because there's no. It's a really good question, and I think that's um, you know it's it's part of the conversation as far as um, how you, Russia's version of history can be. Uh, reconciled with just about everybody else's version of history. Um, you know, that Ukraine is a nation is indisputable. And, you know, I'm not a historian, but there are enough um, qualified historians who had responded to that essay. And there are just as many who didn't even feel the need to respond to such outrageous uh, presentation of history. And you know, Serhii Plohi, 
um, is the historian that I would recommend on, um, on, on um, those issues. Um, I, I think that, unfortunately, I don't see a lot of um, hope in um, uh, convincing or persuading uh, the Russian elites and, and the Russian sort of uh, um, opinion leaders that their version of Ukrainian history is fundamentally wrong. Um, I, I think that we're going to be in a situation, unfortunately, where we have these completely, uh, there's no common baseline, right? There are irreconcilable positions as to some fundamental um, understandings of Ukrainian nationhood. And it will, I think it will be a, um, a, a problem and, and a stumbling stone for us for a while, um, because these historical narratives have been weaponized you know, politics of, of memory are in play here. Um, and that is also why, um, you know, the Russian sort of civilizational development is the way it is and sort of this belief in Russia's greatness and, and military power as being decisive in, in, the, in, in, in the current world um, has to do with uh, historical memory, right? And, and has to do with, um, you know, this self-perception and uh, self-identification as a great power was, um, you know, was an extensive sphere of influence. And that is unfortunately, that contradicts historical accounts um, on which uh, Ukrainian nationhood had been built. Um, so I, I think, um, unfortunately, I don't think we are, that these issues, identity issues are not, unfortunately, are not a matter of how persuasive they are. They have they have been internalized via historical and educational, cultural discourses. And I think we are unfortunately stuck with a Russia and the Russian elite that will continue believing that Ukraine is not a real country. And you know how we incorporate that, that vision of history into a secure, into a security architecture that works for everybody is what's being, um, figured out, worked out right now. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, coming from the Balkans, I can only confirm how important is uh, uh, memory and uh, the creation of memory. Every memory history uh, is a social construct. It can be weaponized. And uh, uh, maybe it's not a critical one that will change the course of the game trajectory, but this uh, can be smartly used uh, for the political purposes. That brings me to the Balkans, uh, because there is another question um, uh, by one of our guests. Uh, Isak asks, uh, how the current situation in Ukraine and arrest there in, in the country may um, spill over uh, to other European regions, vulnerable regions like Western Balkans, where Russia has uh, uh, evidently influenced like Bosnia and Herzegovina, Kosovo, Montenegro, Serbia, and so on. What do you what do you think? I think Vesco, you might be better off asking this answering this uh. question. So okay, I'm going then to I'll defer I'll, to you. I'll, I'll, you, I'll you, uh, you, bring, you bring a regional expertise there. Okay. What do you think? What do, how are you reading the, the signals? Uh, my reading is, I will be brief. I don't want to take your time because you are here in the limelight, not me. So uh, I think that definitely will make an influence, um, impact. Uh, I will just say one sentence. A couple of days ago in, in Montenegro, we were uh, witnessing a, a small diplomatic war between uh, US embassy, Ukrainian embassy and Russian embassy. They exchanged verbal notes and press statements, uh, uh, you know, attacking one another. And I will highlight the statement of Russian em uh, embassy in Montenegro, by which they said that a uh, region may experience something similar as Ukraine if the uh, situation continues like this. So, and they accused the Americans for blackmailing Montenegrin government. So that tells something, uh, uh, but not everything. And maybe we may discuss this on another occasion. I will. Um, now, uh, um, uh, pose another question, actually, question from uh, Andrew, who uh, uh, asks, uh, what is the economic damage uh, to Ukraine right now, and how would that increase if Russia decides to invade? Um, it's a really good question. I think it's, it's, it's too soon to tell yet. Um, one thing that is quite remarkable is that last year, Ukraine actually reported uh, the highest GDP uh, yet, so the economy was actually in terms of, you know, if, if you use GDP as one measure, then obviously it has improved. Now, where the current, you know, war scares and lack of transparency 
um, on the part of, of Zelensky's government, I think definitely deterred investors. You know, we, we have seen, um, I don't know exactly how it affected uh, the Ukrainian stock market, but um, I, I have seen reports that the markets respond very negatively to instability and unpredictability in any situation that Ukrainian economy is likely to be affected because obviously of the impending war scares, but also because um, I think some of it also has to do with the way the Zelensky administration had um, approached uh, information sharing and transparency. You know, we have seen a, a, a very kind of different um, govern, government governance model which emphasizes uh, secrecy and manipulating narratives um, and kind of controlling um, narratives in, in a way to create the optics of business as usual, which everybody knows is not true, right? So there were questions uh, for Zelensky as far as how his chosen tactic of, um, you know, of calm and, and no panic response was actually created an opposite reaction among investors because they can't trust that he can be transparent and honest enough in um, highlighting the risks and being honest about um, you know, risks to investors. So that's one aspect. And the other aspect of, this, of it is that um, one of, even though Ukraine has undergone many reforms, you know, police reform, decentralization reform, uh, have been the most successful that had been also funded by uh, various you know, Western or, uh, government orga uh, organizations and, and funds. Uh, but where Ukraine is still um, sort of lagging behind is in the judicial reform, um, you know, uh, extrajudicial arrests and um, um, uh, sort of this lack of, um, um, again, transparency and um, uh, uh, transparency of the of the judicial system and independence of courts had been um, uh, problematic lately. And, and again, investors, the reason um, Ukraine had um, deterred investors in the past was it was exactly because of these sort of judicial and, and um, um, shortcomings that that Ukraine had unfortunately been struggling to correct since uh, since the Soviet times, so to speak. Um, so I think there are positive and negative signs. I mean, absolutely, I think that um, the current predicament that Ukraine is in will, of course, deter investors. We have we have seen already how airlines responded. You know, when airlines kind of individually, uh, arbitrarily, were canceling flights. Uh, I was supposed to fly to Ukraine. I was I'm supposed to be in Ukraine today. I was actually fully expecting to be giving this talk uh, from Ukraine. But um, I was supposed to fly on Wednesday and I was expecting United Airlines to cancel the flight because Wednesday was the, that, that uh, window of a potential attack that was um, disclosed by uh, US intelligence services that you know, didn't happen, but I think that there are still um, dynamics that are pointing in that direction. So anyway, so various, you know, even airlines have discontinued flights. Obviously it has affected uh, the economy, you know, look at all the massive evacuations, right? All the foreign governments, you know, evacuated their embassies. So that couldn't be, you know, that, that's not going to facilitate um, economic development. So unfortunately, I think that's what one of the things that Russia has in fact been trying to achieve is to deny Ukraine the progress that it has um, achieved so far, prevent Ukraine from growing economically and politically, um, and use every opportunity to undermine its resources, to undermine its credibility, and to make it so vulnerable as to turn back to Russia for help. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, 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 I, I, I think that I just received one more one more uh, comment or question, but um, uh, I would like to uh, pose another one question. One other question on behalf of uh, one of our guests. Uh, it deals more with, um, uh, let's say, real politics actually, uh, and drives line between soft power and hard power. Uh, uh, I will paraphrase the question because it's a, a, a long. Uh, Korkut asks, uh, what would have happened had the Ukraine? Uh, uh, 1994 decided not to give up its nuclear weapon given what's going on with um, with um, with north korea and iran uh 
uh, whether we support those regimes or not, that's another question. But given what's going on uh, with them, then can we now, in retrospect, say that you know things would have been different had Ukraine decided to keep uh, nuclear weapons? Uh, how we can make distinction between, like, say, deterrence uh, in this case and hard power, and something that you mentioned that uh, most people in Ukraine right now is supportive to European Union and NATO, which means soft power. Uh, should then we work more on pe with people and place importance on people working with them, which means on soft power, or should um, uh, uh, you know, uh, securitization and hard power actually plays more important role. I know it's a complex question, but uh, if you can briefly touch upon that one, uh, we would appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. It is a complex question. It's a good one too. Now, these these conversations about um, the relevance of nuclear weapons and nuclear deterrence um, in um, in pursuit of, or in, both in, in terms of national security strategy, but also in uh, uh, pursuit of power um, and leverage. You know, I think the conversation here is whether Ukraine would have had more leverage had it had uh, nuclear weapons. Now, it's really hard, you know, I, I, you know, these historical counterfactuals are, you know, really hard to justify because, you know, they, they are so, you know, every, every action is a reaction to another action, right? So if that, um, if Ukraine didn't give up its nuclear weapons, then it would have generated a set of responses that are completely unknown to us right now and unimaginable. So it's really hard to um, uh, to predict that situation. But I think that, um, you know, I, I don't think that it would have been better for Ukraine. So I fundamentally believe that um, the it was the right decision because, and here's why, uh, because um, uh, by giving up uh, nuclear weapons. So first of all, Ukraine, the command and control uh, for nuclear weapons was still in, in Moscow. So Ukraine didn't really have full control of, um, of the nuclear arsenal that was stored on its territory. Um, so it's not as though um, it, you know, those, those weapons were fully operational. So that's one limitation. And the other thing is that uh, by giving up nuclear weapons, um, you know, the Ukraine actually was allowed to uh, join the NPT, the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons Treaty, um, as a non-nuclear weapon state. Um, and also that is exactly what allowed, what, what um, got Ukraine, landed Ukraine on this uh, course of European integration. So um, the reason um, you know, Ukraine had been embraced by the European community and it received so much assistance is exactly because it became a non-nuclear state um, that allowed it to uh, you know, join, again, NPT and, and to um, kind of pursue these ambitions of Western integration um, uh, on completely non-nuclear terms, so to speak. So it's sort of... Um, it's hard to tell, um, you know, which way it would have played out better for Ukraine, um, but I think again, it, if if we're talking about uh, European uh, integration as and being part of the European Community of rule of law, uh, sort of nuclear non-proliferation um, value system, then um, you know, if if that is where Ukraine wants to be ultimately, then I, I think that fundamentally that was the right decision at that time. Um, but of course, um, it's it's hard to you know kind of know that now. Um, but again, ultimately, if Ukraine sees itself as a member of the European Community and potentially NATO in the future, um, then um, in retrospect, then I think that was an important component of getting on that path. Uh, another question along the same line, I think that this will be the final one uh, posed by my colleague Kaya Shilde, uh, and deals with, I would say, in a broader term, the same uh, uh, the same type of like a, a, a issue or the, like a dilemma uh, between hard and soft power. Uh, you know, uh, as a, a Chancellor Schultz uh, mentioned during uh, uh, during his visit uh, a couple of days ago to to Moscow that you know, uh, NATO is not considering a uh, membership of Ukraine right now. And as be honest, uh, even at the time when I was in NATO, that was not an issue, uh, maybe in, in perspective, but nothing, nothing in the foreseeable future. So then the question is, uh, what is then a, a precursor of uh, uh, Russia's 
uh, decision um, to uh, make pressure on Ukraine, uh, including potential invasion, annexation of additional territories of Ukraine, as it did with, with the Crimea. Is it uh, with Crimea? It did uh, in, after European Union accession agreement uh, uh, with uh, with Ukraine. So the whether it is whether what is the problem, the core. Uh, of, of problem uh, NATO enlargement or European Union expansion uh, or the growth of European Union normative power, values or, or hard power. Uh, what, uh, how to say, Moscow uh, is more concerned about uh, values, spreading values, uh, or, uh, uh, you know, coming, uh, NATO coming close to uh, its borders. Um. It, it, there's a lot of that question. Uh, it's, it's a good question. Um, so as I, I think I, I had uh, partially answered it in, in my presentation too, that it's all of those things, right? It's NATO. I think NATO presents less of a security threat to Russia uh, than a more of a geopolitical and geocultural threat. As a matter of fact, um, I've seen some surveys where um, uh, you know, both Russian and Ukrainian uh, residents were asked if they perceive NATO and, and the EU to be sort of similar, um, and and the majority say yes. So, in the minds, in the in the imagination of average people, NATO and the EU are sort of a go side by side. And as a matter of fact, Ukrainian uh, public opinion surveys show that. Um, the people directly answer that question as, you know, do you think of NATO and the EU as similar um, uh, institutions um, that Ukraine would, you know, needs, or it would be good for Ukraine to join? And people say yes to both. So there, there is that, and I think it is about soft power and how, um, so these institutions have acquired a, a certain um, image of, you um, being about cooperation, rule of law, right? Um, you know, so, so this freedom uh, of choice, um, freedom of, of speech, a uh, uh, value system. And I think that's what's, what's threatening to Russia. So in that way, I think that the, Russia is, is threatened both by NATO and the EU, because let's, let's be honest, it's not as though uh, NATO forces have ever threatened Russia, right? Uh, you know, NATO um, is a defensive institution. Obviously, it's all about perceptions. Russia perceives it as offensive. There's a fundamental security dilemma in play here. So those are all understandable issues and, and valid concerns. I, I, you know, I think that Russia's fears of NATO are validated, but I don't think that the fear of NATO as a security or a defense alliance is as dominant in their, in their threat perception as geostrategic and geocultural choices that Ukrainians are making by uh, by pursuing, by having ambitions to join these institutions. So it's more about a, um, a cultural drift, a, a value drift. Um, and, and that has to do with what's, you know, ontological security. I think that as much as realism may uh, be, uh, you know, powerful in explaining, um, you know, what we're seeing right now was the use of a military force, hard power as the ultimate instrument of a political achieving political objectives. But I think fundamentally there's other there are two other things in play here is one is ontological security in the sense of uh, identity um, that translates into how countries uh, approach their security and, 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 and that's based on the, the feeling um, you know, the sense of belonging and an ownership of a certain cultural space that they claim that as their own. Uh, and the other thing is loss aversion. I think Russia is more afraid to lose something than to than they want to gain something. I don't think they they're not trying to gain uh, more as much as they're trying not to lose what they think is theirs. So I think loss aversion is more um, explains more of Russia's behavior than pursuit of land or more. I don't think they're expansionist in terms of territory. I, I, I really don't believe that Russia is trying to recreate the Soviet Union in terms of its sort of geographic expansion. But I do think that they're um, paranoid about countries kind of move, drifting away from them in terms of uh, soft power, in terms of not subscribing to the Russian way of life and values. And that is, um, scary to, to Russia. And, 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 and again, I was just gonna, I'll just probably highlight once again that 
um, loss aversion is the name of the game here. Okay, I, I like your, your, your point about loss aversion. So let conclude our, our discussion. I'm really thankful uh, for really stimulating, intellectually stimulating uh, and informative discussion. I'm, I'm sure, I'm confident that uh, our guests have learned a lot. Uh, uh, let's say, uh, not say, but it's obvious stage is set. Um, hopefully, uh, play will be canceled at the very last moment. Let's hope for it. But uh, honestly, uh, from my point of view, uh, uh, it's already everything is in there. Uh, and you invested so much to build up the state that at their perspective, it will not be smart to cancel to cancel play at the very last moment. Thank you, Alana, once again, uh, for insightful um, presentation this afternoon slash morning now is afternoon already yeah thanks so much for having me thanks for your questions and comments i really enjoyed it